And uh, that will be 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll give you a moment to find those two texts. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Corinthians, or rather, Second Corinthians, chapter two, and verses ten and eleven. They say, "To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices." Now turn to First Timothy chapter four. And look at verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I'm going to stop right there. And I'm going to dust off a sermon from about four years ago. Uh, and uh, hopefully add a few comments uh, since that time. And it'll be something worth hearing uh, yet again. Uh, by the way, they say most preachers have about a three-year rotation of their sermons. They, they don't have any more sermons. That every three years they repeat them. And I'm trying to add more to my, my uh, list of sermons so that maybe every four years I'll repeat them. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but I call this sermon, The Devil and You. The Devil and You. On the single island, uh, Australian island of Tasmania, off the southeast coast of the, the mainland of Australia, is a small black furred creature called the Tasmanian Devil. And uh, anyone who's ever seen the Warner Brothers cartoons is, should be familiar with this creature, but I don't mean the, the humorous cartoon type of animal. I'm talking about a real animal. And... Um, Scientists are not sure when this animal first appeared on that island, but, it's, but it only lives in the wild on that island. I don't know if any of them have been captured and kept in a, a captivity or in zoos around the world or not, but it's only found living on that island. And uh, it's a marsupial. In other words, the mother gives birth to the young while they're still underdeveloped, and then she carries them in a separate um, stomach pouch, until they're able, big enough and able to live on their own. Uh, and I've said to you many times, the world around us is a parable. The entire world is a parable, intended to teach some Bible truth, to confirm some Bible truth, or to perhaps point to something in the future the Bible says is going to happen. And... Um, this text will be no different in using it that way to study what I want to study. But uh, the Bible says when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, uh, he treads through the blood of his enemies. The blood is up to the, the horse's bridle, the book of Revelation tells us, uh, at the, at the uh, Battle of Armageddon. And uh, he comes in as a conqueror, uh, wielding a, a, a sword and his arm, and the armies of heaven follow him of which you and I will be a part at that time. And uh, they trample through the blood of the Antichrist and the armies of the world gathered together to try to withstand Jesus Christ when that day comes. And he just plows right through them and tramples until the blood is up on, on vesture dipped in blood. And the blood's up to the horse's bridle. What do we roll out for dignitaries to walk on? The red carpet. And uh, you'll see little things like that all over the world if you keep your eyes open. The whole world is a parable intended to illustrate the Word of God. And um, the Apostle Paul says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices there in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. And this animal helps to illustrate a number of things about Satan, a number of things about the devil that you and I should be reminded of. And so I call this sermon, The Devil and You. To begin with, the Tasmanian devils are not large animals. They're only about 20 pounds on average, about the size of a small dog, maybe a large cat. But they're um, 
tremendously strong, especially in their jaw muscles and their neck. And so they can bite down with incredible force on their prey. Little things can cause uh, damage. They can inflict great pain. We read in the book of James, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. James 3, verse 5. One discarded match, one discarded cigarette bud out the car window can burn down 40,000 acres. We see that repeatedly here in California during dry season, fire season. And um, the Pharisee said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Matthew 12, 24. The name Beelzebub meant the Lord of the Flies. Well, a fly is not very large, not very big. And uh, we read about a man in Mark chapter 5, possessed with unclean spirits. And when Christ asked him what his name was, the voice inside the man said, My name is Legion, for we are many. Mark 5, verse 9. Well, uh, Roman infantry, uh, in the Roman infantry, a legion was anywhere between 3,000 and 5,000 troops. So this man had a multitude of unclean spirits living inside of him. And... Um, if you kick your foot on the bedpost, your bare foot on the bedpost, it hurts, but your whole body is miserable. <laughs> your whole body is miserable until that, that toe stops swelling or the swelling goes down and the bruise goes away. And a small sin can cause uh, unbelievable trouble in your life later on. If you were 15 years old and you started smoking, you thought it was not a big issue and You'd be able to quit soon, and you were going to give it up soon, and you really weren't going to get stuck on it. But now you're 35, 45 years old or older, and you're up to at least two packs a day, and you wish you could quit. You really wish you could. And uh, uh, little devils can cause big problems. That's point number one. Little devils can cause big problems. Never let the small size of something, of something fool you. You start off drinking just a little bit, and you say, well, I don't want to get hooked on it. I don't want to get stuck on it. Uh, I'm just doing it with my friends, but for the rest of the week, I'm not going to do it. But you'll find you'll end up doing it. The advertisers, remember Budweiser, they were advertising, uh, put a little weekend in your week. Remember that slogan on some of Budweiser's commercials? Put a little weekend in your week. That is, don't wait until Saturday night to party. Party on Wednesday. Party on Thursday. Party on Tuesday, Friday. And a little sin can cause big problems. Little devils can cause big problems. Next, let me say this. The scientific name or the, the genus name for the Tasmanian devil is Sarcophilus. That means flesh-loving. Flesh-loving. And uh, those animals begin early on satisfying the needs of their flesh. Uh, most female mammals, uh, dogs, cats, even pigs, when, they're, when the female is, is uh, carrying young, she develops just enough nipples under her belly as the number of children, or the number of babies she's about to deliver. If you count the number of nipples under the belly of a, a dog that's expecting, you have a pretty good idea how many puppies she's carrying because her body's getting ready to nurse each one. But the Tasmanian devils, the females, give birth to between 20 and 30 young. But inside that stomach pouch, she carries them in. There are only four nipples. And they begin life before they even are, survive on their own, fighting to the death to see which ones are going to get enough nourishment to live. Their existence begins with a fight uh, to survive, to satisfy the needs of their flesh and the wants of their flesh, and the weaknesses of your flesh can be an awfully strong influence. The devil knows uh, if he can get you involved in a sin or the satisfaction of your wants and your lusts, he can divert you from living for Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian. If he can get you uh, caught up and uh, absorbed and obsessed with the needs of your flesh, the wants of your flesh, the desires of this life, uh, it, for too long, it'll keep you from ever wanting to become a Christian. 
It's amazing how many people think that this pleasure is all I need. Once that fun is passed, I, oh, I need another pleasure. And I, then I need another one. And uh, it's, it's sort of like learning the, the lessons of people who were drinkers, they were alcoholics, or they were drug users, drug abusers, and, or any other number of vices you might want to name. And you learn that, and you know that that person never found happiness. They've got a test. You can look through history and look through time. But consider just your own family. Consider people you've known over the last 20, 30, 40 years uh, who thought that they were going to be happy by alcohol, thought that they were going to be happy by another uh, uh, marriage or some other spouse, a new husband, a new wife. They thought they were going to finally be happy if they got this or that, and they never were happy. But you think, well, it'll be different for me. What an idiot. Why don't people learn from the lessons of past uh, failures so that you don't have to become like that? But people are very stubborn. And people are very uh, uh, foolhardy. They think it won't happen to me. I'll be different. I'll be the exception. But you live for your flesh and you satisfy your flesh. And the devil knows if he can get you consumed and obsessed with your flesh, It'll get your mind off spiritual things. It'll keep your mind off spiritual things. The Bible says the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one, a tree to be desired to make one wise. Genesis 3 verse 6. Satan said to the Lord Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Matthew 4 verse 3. The Bible says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2, 16. And Satan is called the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. And the God of this world knows that if he can entice you with fleshly things and earthly temptations, uh, he'll either ruin you as a Christian or keep you from ever becoming a Christian. Paul writes, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Uh, Romans 7, 18, I want to do what's right. I know what's right, but for some reason I keep doing what's wrong. This flesh is a, a weight that you carry around. And uh, the devil wants to ruin you and destroy you by your flesh, if at all possible. But the devil wants you to love your flesh more than God. Love your flesh more than God. Next, let me say this. The Tasmanian devils are not, are not only flesh-loving, but they are cannibalistic. The mother will sometimes even eat her own young. God had repeatedly warned the nation of Israel uh, not to corrupt themselves, not to corrupt their children with the wickedness of the nations around them. Leviticus chapters 18, 19, and 20 make this abundantly clear. You can read the, the list of the different rotten, rotten sins and corruptions in Leviticus 18 God said not to do. And among those, those things, you'll find uh, fornication with animals, you'll find homosexuality, you'll find incest, all of those things listed there. And uh, those, are, those sins are plaguing uh, nations even today. But he said, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Deuteronomy 6. Verses 6 and 7. The Lord expects godly parents to teach their children about the Word of God and uh, the love of God when they're sitting at their dinner table, when they're sitting on their knee, when they're tucking them in bed at night. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 53 to 57, and we won't turn there, God warned the nation of Israel that if they chose to disobey His commands, disregard His admonitions, the time would come that they would find themselves so uh, desperate that they would turn, they would resort to eating their own children just to survive. And we read later on in the scriptures that very thing actually happened. 
The Bible says, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass that when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. There in 2 Kings 6, 28-30. This present age is doing all that it can to destroy and ruin the hopes and the futures and the possibilities and the opportunities of its children. You know that? I saw a kid just earlier this week. He, had, he couldn't be any older than 14. He might have still been 13, you know, just kind of tall for his age. Still, still young, about 14 years old. And he already had neck tattoos like gang members have. Because his parents allowed them to do it. And they were no better. Okay, he's not old enough to get a work permit to get a part-time job, and he's already handicapped himself. I don't care if you're working in an office or behind the counter at McDonald's. Uh, your manager doesn't want you looking like a gangbanger uh, when you're, you know, taking orders or taking or doing business. Every day, or nearly every week, I should say, we hear some new story about a, a physical a, a PE teacher or some school teacher or some religious leader or priest and so forth who abuses children and molests children, takes advantage of children, and uh, they take the most, the most precious thing in the world, somebody else's ch children, and they corrupt them, and they pervert them, and they abuse them, and they misuse them, they twist their young spirits into experimentation for the kids old enough to know what's going on. You think that's not the work of the devil? That's the work of the devil. There are, there are men in this world who may be your school teacher, they may be your minister, they may be a priest, they may be a rabbi, or what doesn't, that, that doesn't matter which occupation they have, who are nothing more than devils in human form walking around the world today, doing all they can to destroy the lives of children. Remember that we have examples of uh, ruined children so numerous that it's almost unnecessary to, to describe it. Well, you all know what I'm talking about. But you hear about these kids who, who uh, uh, were cutting themselves a couple years ago because they're all upset for some unknown reason. A bunch of fifth graders. And uh, you're some kid who, who sits around, he, he say, makes plans to go to his high school and kill other school children, uh, kill, kill other students. The shooting in Florida, the one in Columbine, Colorado, about 20 years ago. That's another issue. Gun violence. Let's blame the gun manufacturer for what some poor, pathetic kid did. Nobody blames Ford when someone gets in the car accident. You know, you go to the military, they say, well, he might, in the, in, the, in the U.S. military, he might have been entrusted to carry a firearm and taught how to use that firearm. Uh, but once he enters into civilian life, he doesn't have to have a gun. We don't need our population of our citizens armed. Well, you know, when you join the Army or the Marine Corps, the Navy or the Air Force, you might... Uh, be driving a Hummer. You might be driving a Jeep. You might be driving a tank. But once you enter civilian life, you don't need to own your own car, do you? That's the same logic. But, you know, the wolf seeks the weakest, uh, the most vulnerable uh, lamb in the flock. Likewise, Christ likened the devil to a thief. He said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, John 10.10. 10. So the point, num point number three, I'd say that the devil seeks to destroy the young. The devil seeks to destroy, the, whether it's a young person, whether it's a, a young Christian, a brand new Christian, who's not grounded yet in his faith, wants to get him off into some uh, perverse doctrine or some idea 
that you need this in order to be saved. You need to do that to go to heaven or you're going to lose your salvation. You can't depend on the Bible. You've got to depend on some other thing. You've got to submit yourself uh, and your mind and your own uh, faculties to the authority of some church hierarchy. But the devil seeks to destroy the young. Next, let me say, the Tasmanian devils are known by their screams and, uh, and, and their cacophonous cries. They don't have a real pleasant hum or a nice little um, um, purr in their voices where you want to actually go up and touch one and pet one. They're not like that. And spiritually, we read, the devils also came out of many crying out. Luke 4, 41. And in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. Luke 4, verse 33. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with him. Acts 8, 7. Uh, whether it's the loud volume of uh, some beer commercial uh, or it's the loud uh, screeching sounds of Madonna or Lady Gaga or some uh, popular uh, music act or whether it's the chants of homosexuals and some gay... You know, back in 1988-89, they were marching through the streets of New York City saying, we're here, we're queer, and we want your children. But the old adage that the squeaky wheel gets the grease is true. And uh, you give them... In the old adage, you give someone an inch, they're going to take a mile. Uh, let's legalize their... Let's legalize their perverse arrangements and call it a marriage. They're not satisfied. They still won't shut up. You're right. Right now, uh, homosexuality is being, uh, it has been mandated to be taught in uh, California public schools as a alternative way of living. And I forget which time. And, and as long as young as uh, kindergarten, first grade, elementary school levels. The devil wants to destroy the young. Fourthly, the devils can't keep silent. That's the, that's the point I'm trying to make. The devils can't keep silent. Sometimes you want peace and quiet and you want solitude to focus on the Lord like you ought to. But the world around you is trying to distract you and interrupt you and keep you from having any tranquility, any serenity, any peace of mind, peace in your heart. If you go to the Lord in prayer and you want to spend some time talking to God, uh, that's when the phone rings. That's when someone knocks on your door. That's when someone calls out to you and has a question they have to ask you. You're trying to read your Bible and just spend time talking, letting God talk to you by his book. The same things, the same interruptions come. It just gets harder and harder, more challenging to be alone with God, to talk to God and let God talk to you. And the devil knows what he's doing. But the devils can't keep silent. Next, let me say this. The Tasmanian devil looks at looks he looks like several other animals all stitched together. He's got the ears of a bear. He's got the snout like a dog. He has teeth like a warthog and a furry tail that that moves much like the tail of a rat. And the Bible predicts that one day there will be a world leader, we call him the Antichrist, who will be likened to several animals all at once. With the feet of a bear the mouth of a lion, and the overall body of a leopard, having seven heads and ten horns on his head, Revelation 13 describes to us. The Antichrist is foreshadowed uh, in several texts throughout the Bible, just a few of them here. He's called the man of the earth, Psalm 10:18. He's called the oppressor, Psalm 72:4. The spoiler, Isaiah 16:4. He's called the violent man, Psalm 18:48. The most proud, Jeremiah 30, or excuse me, Jeremiah 50, verse 32. He's called the adversary, Psalm 74, 10. The son of wickedness, Psalm 89, verse 22. And it, there are several others. 
But Satan can be illustrated by the Tasmanian devil uh, in this respect. The devil uses any means necessary to accomplish his work, to undo the grace and the work of Jesus Christ, undo the saving uh, blessing of God in the heart of a sinner, in the soul of a sinner. And whatever he has to do or whoever he has to destroy and ruin, he'll do it. The devil uses any means necessary. That was the slogan of a lot of uh, agitation back in the 1960s between uh, uh, black race and the white race. And we're going to overthrow uh, whitey by any means necessary. It was part of their. And I think some of them were controlled by the devil, too, at that time. But that's another subject as well. I keep introducing these things that are other subjects. And uh, we may come to that one day. We may not. But next, consider this. The Tasmanian devils do most of their killing at night. They eat other dead animals, but they, but when they do kill, they prefer to do it at nighttime. Proverbs 4, verses 18 and 19 say, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Uh, Jesus said, this is the condemnation. This is the problem, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil, John 3, 19. So point number six, the devil offers only darkness. You see so many kids these days, the black t-shirts, black pants, jet black hair, black eyeliner. Those are the boys. Uh, black trench coats, black boots, black socks. And black hearts. They need the light of Jesus Christ. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ to pierce through that darkness and show them that God loved them enough to send Jesus Christ to suffer on their behalf, to die for their sake, to suffer for their sins. The life is not uh, gloomy and bleak. Uh, there actually is hope for Jesus. There's hope for the sinner in Jesus Christ. But uh, when kids are wandering the streets dressed like that at uh, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, I promise you they're not on their way to a Bible study class. They're out looking for trouble. They're out looking for um, mischief to get into, hoping that the cover of darkness will keep somebody from recognizing them on the street. and There'll be less traffic on the streets, so there are fewer chances of people recognizing them. They have darkness in their hearts because the devil offers only darkness. That's my next point. The devil offers only darkness. And lastly, consider this. The Tasmanian devil prefers to eat uh, what's called carrion, C-A-R-R-I-O-N. Carrion, that's a very polite word for some animal that's already been killed by some other means. Vultures are like that. They circle around looking for something dead on the ground and then swoop in to, to, kill, to, to eat it. Uh, but the Tasmanian devil prefers roadkill rather than killing itself, killing for its own satisfaction. Uh, and they aren't bothered by the smell of rotting flesh. As a matter of fact, they probably like it. They probably like it. And one sign that somebody is being influenced by unclean spirits is they have some odd strange attraction to dead bodies and dead things. It might sound strange, Pastor Shrive works at a funeral home during the week. But I tell you, they have to pay me to go there. But I've met people during the course of my day job uh, at the funeral home who have a strange and odd fixation with the dead and death and the dead bodies. And uh, they want to wander into other people's visitation rooms and see uh, their loved one in the casket. They have no relationship to those people, but they're but out of curiosity, they come in anyway. We were dismissing people out of our chapel one day, and you know, we we're dismissing them row by row and asking them to exit out the door to the left. And this woman on the street from off the street, she just came in, got in the line, walked up, and then looked at someone's deceased loved one, and then exited out with everyone else. And I've met, you know, they have these old hearse car clubs. They have old car clubs, old Chevys, old Fords, but they're also old hearse car clubs. And uh, they used to have this old hearse club that would participate in the Kiwanis uh, 
um, old car show on Euclid Avenue. And I don't know if they still do or not, but you see these guys who own their own funeral car and they line them up and these are old 40, 50 year old funeral hearses that they've restored and they're in prime condition. And uh, I mean, it's interesting to see them and the stories behind those cars, but these guys that belong to these old hearse car clubs are weird. They really are. When they get, they buy a casket and they carry it in the back of their car. So when they drive around town, it, it scares people. And uh, they want to pull up next to you at Walmart, so you get freaked out when you're going shopping. We buried a guy uh, who had belonged to one of these clubs and uh, had carried his own casket around in the back of the car for some time. We buried him in that casket, and we drove him in his car to the cemetery uh, on the day of the funeral. And about 30 other club members were following a procession in their car, in their hearses. It made the front page of the newspaper that that day. But there are people who are obsessed with death and dying and and the macabre and the gruesome aspects of of dying that's not natural. That's not healthy. But right now there's all kinds of movies and television shows trying to glamorize and romanticize death and vampires and all of that sort of thing. And it can't be done. It can't be done. And the, the man possessed in Mark chapter 5, he was said to have his dwelling among the tombs. Mark 5 verse 3. He lived in the graveyard. He lived. You know, the legend of the Buddha is that the Buddha would often sleep in the cemetery or the graveyard. And the man in Mark 5 was said to be possessed with devils. And so I assume the Buddha was possessed with devils as well. Uh, the strange thing about the Buddha is that nobody knows if he even existed. There's plenty of testimonial evidence and historical evidence that Jesus really existed. But whether the Buddha ever lived uh, is anyone's guess. But every year, superstitious Mexicans go out to the cemetery in November, or rather October 31st, the Day of the Dead, and they make a small picnic at the grave of their mother, their father, and they pray and think that their mother and father will answer them and pray and asking them to intercede for them to God. Um, and it's sad because those people, those persons cannot intercede for you. If anyone pres presumes to intercede for you and claims that they're the spirit of your lost mother, your lost father, that's a devil. That's an unclean spirit trying to pass itself off as someone that you would trust. So you'll trust them. Missing loved ones is natural. But when it comes to learning about the devil, uh, my uh, last point here, the devil offers only death. The devil offers only death. And I'm going to try to be, bring this to a close. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, say amen. amen. I'm so glad that I uh, came to know him as a young boy, six years old. In the best way I knew how, I asked God to forgive me, to save my soul, write my name in heaven. And um, I didn't understand everything there was to know about sin, but I knew enough that I was a sinner. And if God had a right to judge sinners, he had a right to judge me. I didn't want to go to hell when I died. And if all you know is you don't want to go to hell someday, that's all the motive you need to trust Jesus Christ.